It is our pleasure to welcome a distinguished neuroscientist to the stage. His work has led to discoveries in neural development, nerve regeneration, and nerve machine interfaces. He is an associate professor of bioengineering here at UT Arlington and UT Southwestern Medical Center. Please give a hearty welcome to Dr. Mario Romero Ortega. So this is uh, Christopher Reeve on his role as Superman. This is a superhero that can overcome any challenges. And uh, Christopher had to learn about this character when he faced his own tragedy. In May of 1995, he suffered an accident during an equestrian competition that rendered him paralyzed from the neck down. At that time, the thought was that such an injury would were, were left him paralyzed for the rest of his life. So the chances for him to walk again were slim to none. But he didn't think so. He thought that he will walk again. And in Discover from Times Magazine, he indicated that a cure for paralysis can and should be found. In the same note, they also questioned whether or not that was a very ambitious goal. And the reason why the skepticism was there is because of what we know about this type of injury. The injury of the spinal cord is uh, into that soft tissue effectively disconnects the brain from your motor organs. And studies done at the microscopic level looking at the injury side reveals that these fibers that normally will connect your brain to your limbs are uh, transected and then stopped at the injury side, unable to be uh, unable to regenerate. In fact, this observation was done by a scientist, a very prominent scientist, uh, Santiago Ramon in Cajal, who said the following. After reviewing that evidence, he said the founts of growth and regeneration for axons and dendrites have dried irrevocably. He said the nerve paths in the, adult, in the adult are something fixed, ended, immutable. Moreover, after injury, everything may die, nothing may be regenerated. This is, if you look at it, it's a, it's a little bit pessimistic view, but one that was rooted in evidence and affected and influenced the medical and scientific community for decades. That was the view that the doctors had treated my friend, Alma Peña, uh, had in mind. Obviously, Alma is sitting there with me and also my friend, uh, Dr. Douglas Benson. They both received this news of perhaps you will not be able to walk again. Alma asked me a very specific question that was, uh, knowing that I was a student at Tulane University studying neuroscience, she asked me when can I walk again, and I decided to change my career, my, my focus in research from understanding how the brain controls hormones to trying to understand how neurons respond to injury. I was lucky enough to see that Christopher Reeve had found a foundation along with his wife, Dana. And that foundation raised not only public awareness, but funds to support young students and leading scientists I am there with Christopher Reeve, Tim by the right, and I was fortunate enough to be funded, but not only funded, also inspired by the goal of walking again. So let me tell you in the next few minutes what I've learned in the, in the last 15 years or so. First of all, let me explain the system. The system that we're gonna talk about is the system that controls our movements. It's organized by neurons that are located in their brain. These, nerves are very, these neurons are very specific. They have the capacity to extend a portion of their cell body for long distance down into the course, into the, from the cortex into the brain stem until they reach a point in which they cross to the other side. Many of these axons actually do that. They continue on the same side and they eventually find targets in the spinal cord that control your movements. Now these are amazing cells because they have the capability of strength, stretching themselves and navigate their way along this pathway. They can do that because at the end they have a very sophisticated navigation system that it will be the, that it allows it to feel and sense small amounts of chemicals. This will be the equivalent of you and I having the capacity to stretch our hands to reach for a friend who's sitting in the third level of the Texas Rangers Stadium watching a game, and we'll be finding him only because the smell of the perfume that he or she is wearing. Okay, that's very amazing if you think about it. Now we know that this growth cone, this amazing structure, which is the navigation system, can find its target by that capacity. And we know that the target communicates with this growth cone, and we know that because we can look at cells that are located in the brain. Um, you can see them here, and you can see that the nerves are black, but the fibers are able to connect them. You can now see the fibers overlying in, in yellow, and they're connecting with the red neurons. In this particular case, all the neurons are nicely aligned, but what if you were 
to mix those nerves? Can those fibers find them? And there are situations in the brain in which these neurons are randomly located. This is a result of a mutation. Under which circumstances, you can, feel, you can see how the axons are capable of finding them and connecting them. So we believe that there are some signals that are provided by the targets that guide these neurons in a very effective way, right? These might be things that neurons really, really like and entice them to grow. We also know that these neurons are different. In other words, not all cells are created equal. Here you can see nerve cells in the sensory ganglion, and you can see that we can label them in two different colors, green and red. The green ones are cells that sense our motion, our movements. The red ones are cells that feel pain. Now, we believe that if we can entice some of them. So for instance, I know that perhaps we can offer some goodies to the green cells. Now, if we were to do that in vitro in an experiment, only the green cells will be able to grow, meaning not all of them will do. And we achieved this experiment in the laboratory of Luis Parada. And you can see there that not all the nerves are growing, but only a subpopulation of fibers are able to do so. You can achieve exactly the same result if you were to turn on a switch inside those cells. Now, going back to the system, uh, you will see that these nerves then, we believe, are able to go out from the brain into the spinal cord following something enticing, something really good, like chocolates. And then we'll hit the middle of the, of the road, and at some point, most of them find a stop sign that forces them to grow to the other side. And they continue probably following another goodie until they find the target. Now, we know that these fibers cross only once. They don't cross twice. Why? Because we know that one side of our brain controls once the other side of our body. And we can dissociate our limb movements. So there must be other type of, of stop signals that prevents them from crossing back and forth. In fact, I was fortunate enough to find one of these molecules when I was a postdoc in the laboratory of Louis, working with a collaborator of ours, uh, Mike Henkelme Mark Henkelmeyer. We found this molecule because it's right there, expressed by cells in the middle of the spinal cord, clearly separating the left from the right. So what we decided to do is to take that molecule, put it on a stripes on a tissue culture, and put neurons on top of them. We knew that some cells would not pay attention to the stop sign, and they will grow over it. But we also knew that some of them will be stopped, and the green cells here respect very clearly that stop sign. Then we decided to go uh, take a little step further. What if you were eliminating that molecule, that barrier from an animal? What effect that will have, right? So first of all, let me tell you what we do with, those, with normal animals. We ask normal animals to walk over a balance beam, and you can see they take alternative steps, just as you and I will do as we walk. On the other hand, if you take the barrier out from the middle of the brain, of the spinal cord, these animals are hopping like rabbits. This is very similar to a condition in humans known as mirror movement disorders. The sort of thing where people try to move one finger and the other one moves at the same time. That happens because this, this spinal cord, these fibers are crossing to the, both sides of the spinal cord. So we now know that axons follow some molecules and they're repelled by others. And they're also repelled. Now, if you look, go back to the injury that Christopher Reef had in the spinal cord, we know that there is dead at the epicenter. And so we perhaps will have to create a bridge. We also know that we need to entice these axons to grow across the bridge. And finally, we need to guide them precisely to the final destination. So let me tell you about the bridge. In order to develop a bridge, we look to peripheral nerves. Peripheral nerves are, ner are extensions that come out of the spinal cord into our limbs. Now, when you have injuries to the nerves, sometimes there's uh, tissue loss. And a gap results as a result of that. And so in order to repair those gaps, people use, uh, in some cases, artificial nerve conduits. These are hollow tubes that you can use to uh, communicate the, the two transected ends and axons will grow. And this actually uh, works and works effectively. But we believe that this, this strategy can be improved because a hollow tube can offer some support, but perhaps if we can fill it with some luminal fillers, perhaps some microchannels in Nagaro's gels, we can perhaps guide those axons in a more direct way. And we did that. We then compared this so-called biosynthetic nerve that we've made at uh, UT Southwestern, Scott is right, and then develop here at UT Arlington further, and compare that with the current technology at Condio. You can see that nerves are able to cross using that bridge. But most importantly, we have now tested this bridge for longer gaps, say three centimeters. In order to do that, we use a rabbit model. Okay, it's a common peroneal uh, injury. In these rabbits, when you do that injury, the injured side is unable to stress the toe. It's a minor injury, but yet it's a permanent one. If you were to repair this injury with uh, hollow tubes, they will never recover. Using the BNI, you can get recovery two weeks later. In this particular case, the animal is, is able to fully extend their toes. 
So what that shows you is that we can make a bridge. But can we actually guide these neurons across barriers? So we know that there are stop signs there. What can we do? Well, this is when I look for other superheroes. Fat Fury is known to be able to grow, go across walls. And I think that he's able to do that because he sees something really good, like a great meal on the other side of the wall, and he can smell that. So what I decided to do is to have a similar thing offered to the spinal cord. In this particular case, you're seeing a coronal section in the spinal cord. The right side has nice innervation, okay? You can see the bright green staining. On the left side is denervated. That injury is permanent. Neurons are unable to grow back into the spinal cord, but if you put them something tasty, then perhaps they grow back, and in fact, they do. This is something we did when I was a postdoc in George Smith lab. So we can entice them, but we also need to control their growth. So how precisely we can control that growth? We tested that in his lab as well, doing something that is very ingenious, I thought, and that was to create a pathway using certain molecules, lay them down, and then make them make a 90 degree turn towards a target area. The idea was that neurons will be able to follow that, perhaps, right? And in fact, they do. The black staining are neurons that follow that, precisely, that precise track, so we're able to guide them. If you take these three things that I tell you and go back to the injury that I mentioned before in the spinal cord, what you see is that we can put a bridge, we can entice them to grow and guide them directly. And all those are strategies that can be helped to repair the spinal cord. And this is true, but yet, these therapies are still not, not available in the clinic. And what it means is that the problem is not as simple as I just told you. There are millions of fibers descending. We don't know what entices them, all of them. There are also an, an equal number of fibers going in the opposite direction. Those are the sensory fibers. So there's much to be done still to solve this problem. But what we can be sure about is that this knowledge can be applied to other things. Let's consider, for example, limb amputation, okay? There's 1.6 amputees in the United States, about 185,000 are expected every year. This includes a number of veterans that come back from uh, the, war, the battlefield, missing their limbs as a result of their injuries, okay? Thousands of them. The Department of Defense have worked in the last 10 years to support the work of uh, engineers that have been able to develop the most sophisticated robotic prosthetic device, one that can move exactly the same way that your, your, your hand and arm can do. But the challenge is how do you connect that device to your body in the way that you can move it naturally and feel it as your own? In order to achieve that goal, you can take some examples. You can borrow examples from the movies. Right? Hollywood is always good to look for ideas. And you can see here that in Star Wars, uh, Luke Skywalker was fitted with a bionic arm simply by taking the wire out of the arm, put it into the nerve, you're done. Very simply, it's a simple idea, right? And it's actually not that hard. You can do that in the lab, at least we can. We have developed an air guide, this uh, hollow tube. You put microelectrodes, microscopic electrodes that are sitting right there in the path of these regenerating neurons, okay? And as they do that, they serve as microphones, and you can listen to the sound that they make when they carry the information about movement. And then you can use devices like this, eventually, to achieve a more sophisticated goal. And that will be to take severed axons that will be um, uh, amputated nerves, guide them through an air guide, an air conduit, and then separate the motor from the sensory. So you can record from the motor fibers and use that signal to move the robotic hand. And then use the sensory fibers to stimulate and convey sensation in a very natural way. What I just told you is that we have developed certain knowledge about several things. Number one, how neurons develop. Number two, how do they respond to injury? And number three, can you use ways in which you can use that knowledge to come up with very uh, effective, at least more promising uh, technology for treatment of these injuries. So if we go back to Ramon y Cajal in the 1900s, we believe that we can change that pessimistic view. Because if we look at what he said, the founts of growth for regeneration of the axis and dendrites have dried irrevocably. That may be true, but we can add them back. We can now rewrite what he said about nerve paths being something not fixed, ended, or immutable. And in terms of the injury, something may die, but something may be regenerated, even in the absence of natural targets. So this changed at least the pessimistic view. Now we have hope. And that is exactly what Christopher Reeve said once, and I quote, if you have hope, 
Anything is possible. So what do we, where do we go from, from here? We must move forward. It is a, a difficult challenge, right? Walking again, it is a lofty goal. But it's one we, it deserves the work of all of us, to, at least many of us, to continue working towards achieving this fascinating, fascinating goal. And the reason why this is important is because there are millions of people that are suffering from nerve injury conditions that shows <laughs> these are some of the conditions that, have, uh, that result from nerve injuries that perhaps could be benefited by strategies as the ones that I mentioned today. And with that, I thank you for your attention.